So we really want to talk about the importance about relationships, of those next level, going deeper. It really is all about relationships. When you think about it, the older we get, the more we trust, the more we believe in, the more we understand, the more we appreciate relationships and the depth of that, the value of those. I think when I was younger, we took those for granted and, and we invested in those dear relationships, but a lot of those we let go, those that we had had, and, and coming back and reconnecting with some, but also for us to say, this is important to us. Who are those that really need to speak into our life and really need to invest in us, and we need to invest in them because we don't do this journey by ourselves. And so it really is all about relationships. It's all about this relationship, and it's about these relationships. And if you understand something very significant, I think it's interesting, but there is a connection here. There is a cross. There is an intersection of those relationships. And I think it's so important and so valuable for us to understand that really we can't live in healthy relationships here without understanding this in the truest biblical sense of that. We can have good relationships. We can get along. But I've got to tell you, if these relationships are not right, Scripture talks a lot about it, that this relationship is hindered. In fact, when asked about it, Jesus repeated what the Old Testament had said, but it's said in multiple times in the New Testament. But I love Mark 12, 30 and 31, and it says, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. And then love your neighbor as yourself. For years in our church, when we were there, we would talk about this, and I would paraphrase it this way. Love God with everything you've got, every fiber of your being, all that you are and all that you long to be. And love God's kids the way God loves God's kids. And Jesus said you can't separate those. The first and second commandment, they go together. So, see, Jesus talks about that. It is all about relationships here and here. And what I've learned, what we have learned is relationships are so critical in life that you cannot separate those. But the way I am to love God is by loving my neighbor, loving God's kids. That's how I show God how I love him. And how do I love God's kids? By learning to receive and live in the love of God and love him. The only way I can genuinely, we can genuinely love each other is by loving God. But the way we genuinely show him our love is by loving one another. In fact, scripture talks about this. In 1 John chapter 4, there's a lot about God's love and others, but listen to verse 20, 1 John chapter 4. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. Huh, pretty blunt. Pretty straightforward. How are we doing with that? For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. It's all about relationships here and here. So we want to talk about relationships and try living in healthy relationships, growing in those relationships, becoming all that God has designed us to be in living in that environment. A few years ago, I went to North Carolina to visit my mother and her husband, Ray. And they had lived there for several years, and we went to a local grocery store that they often went to. And we got our items, and we went to the checkout counter. And uh, there was a young 20-something gal checking our groceries, and Ray got right up there, and he is totally in conversation with this girl immediately. And she's just checking our groceries, and they're having this conversation. And you got to kind of imagine this guy. He's he uh, could barely reach over the check writing stand, and this little girl... Okay, wait a minute. For those under 30, a check is a piece of paper that you write out your money in cursive writing. 
So cursive writing, <laughs> oh, never mind. So anyway, he's this little man who's standing over this, this check stand, and he's talking to this girl, and they're in conversation, and she keeps checking our groceries, but they're, they are focused on one another. And she finally gets done, and we pay, and there's like seven people deep in the line, and Mom and I are saying, Ray, we got to get going. Let's go. And he, he is not going to move until he has completed that conversation with this young woman. So today we are going to focus on how to have healthy relationships. I, uh, I will be peeking into the life of Jonathan and David. So if you don't know Jonathan and David, this is them. Yes, this is accurate. There I you go. I knew this myself. I knew them. Uh, this is what they look like. And we're going to talk a little bit, of, uh, peek into their story of their friendship. In 1 Samuel 18.1, it says, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. They had a very special friendship that I think we can learn a few things from today. So the realities of relationships, as we talk about that, before we dive into how to live in those healthy relationships, is one of those is relationships are messy. Mm. Because we're messy. Relationships are messy because we are imperfect people. Now, there's a phrase, and, and, and some of you are, are, are at least our age, so it's nice to have you around. A few of you are a little bit older because we, uh, if we were around when you drew that picture, knowing Jonathan and David, there's a few others that uh, may have watched them be born. So, uh, but this weekend, we were accused of uh, walking with Moses, so I don't know how old you must make you feel, but your pastor has been very kind in talking about how old we are. So uh, we appreciate that. But as we talk about this idea of relationships being messy, there is a, a phrase that used to be around for a while, and as we speak now, a lot of people don't know it, but maybe you're familiar with it, EGR. Anybody familiar with the term EGR when you're talking about people? The phrase was, or the, word, the letters were used as a phrase that that person was extra grace required. I don't know if you know this, but we all go through that. We're all needy at some point and some time, and so we're all extra grace required. Right. Probably in our relationship. Gerald needs, no, I, uh, you know, how is that? Where are we? But in any relationship, there's that extra grace required. In fact, it's interesting. And, and there may not be somebody sitting around here, but they say one in three people are an EGR. Studies have shown that. So I, I appreciate your attentiveness to me, but if you just kind of glance to your left, don't glare. If you kind of look, don't linger to your right. You kind of get an idea Okay, turn back to the other person that's not it and just kind of, yeah. I do have some news for you, though. We have found out, though, if you can't recognize or identify the person on your left or your right, we have to break the news to you. Yeah, you're it. Extra grace required means that we are scrambling for, and oftentimes there is that need to be needed. Jonathan and David, although they were great relationship and great representation of relationship, really talk about that. They yeah. really, they did have a messy relationship yeah. in many ways. People are complicated. Yeah, yeah. Some of us are more simplistic than others, but we have that complication side of us, don't we? And as we walk through that, we realize that relationships are messy and things don't go well. How do we deal with it when that happens? Rather than ignoring it or saying it's not a real thing, what do we do with that? Years ago, we were traveling, and we had our oldest child, who was a toddler, two and a half. And Geraldine was pregnant with our second child, and she was very pregnant. The doctor, in fact, had to give her permission to fly. That's how late in the pregnancy she was. And we were getting on a small, small little plane. In fact, I describe it as a torpedo with wings. I thought for sure they were going to open the 
floorboard, and we were going to pedal to try and get enough speed to get going. I mean, it was a small plane, 21 seats, I counted. So it was small for me, and I'm not that big of a guy to get on there. I'm bigger this way than this way, but, you know, kind of get on there. So some of you would have a real hard time. But we got on the plane, and we sat in aisle seats across from each other, small aisle. So we were almost touching, even though it was considered an aisle. You kind of scoot through. You get the picture. We sat down. It's winter time, so we're somewhat dressed for winter, but we basically pack most everything. But we get settled on these tight little seats, and we sit down, and my wife, who is great with child, simply turns to me and says, would you hold Lauren? I'm exhausted. I'm hot. I'm tired. Would you hold her? I said, sure, sweetheart. She said, oh, by the way, when you hold her, just be aware, she said her stomach was a little bit upset. And so you might want to get that barf bag ready. I, in my wisdom and young fatherhood know-it-all, did not say it, but I thought to her, don't worry your sweet little head. Daddy's got this. So I took Lauren and I put her on my lap and I laid her head on my shoulder and I laid back and I tried to go to sleep and get her to rest. And about the time that I doze, which doesn't take very long most of the time, I hear this, and I kind of look and she really doesn't move and nothing else happens and I think, okay, it's all right. We all have bad stomachs. It's okay. And I lay back down and no more lay my head back and all of a sudden, And I realize I have to hold her, and I need to do what my wife had recommended me to do. And I go for the barf bag and the seat in front of me, and I grab it, and I don't have it in time. While I'm holding her and juggling her, I'm doing this thing as she begins to project everything out of a two. You know how much stuff comes out of a a two-and-a-half-year-old toddler body? It's more than you think can be in there. I mean, she is throwing up from her toes. And I am doing the wonderful thing as if I'm saving something. And I'm doing this with what's not getting on her and me and the floor. It is going onto the barf bag, closed barf bag, flat barf bag, not open. And I am juggling, and it was messy. It was ooey, and it was gooey, and it was chunky, and it was dropping off of there, and it was dripping down, and it's going on the floor. Small plane, full plane, everywhere, and it's going over, and everybody can hear what's happening and watch the singing going on. And I am juggling as it drips down to the floor. She finishes, finally. And I think I just set that on the floor with everything else. And we try to clean up with the best we can. People are offering other baby wipes. There's another young family on there. Whatever we can do to clean up, I think more for their sake than the smell and everything than anything else. Feeling sorry for us. I I mentioned it was wintertime, didn't I? So as I sat there... As she threw up over me and her, I had stuff all over me. But I was wearing a cardigan back then. Are you familiar with cardigans? They, the button starts about here, goes down to here. And when you sit down, it makes a pouch. It makes a wonderful pocket to catch all of that. I mean, it is here. It is all down on my pants. It is all over. We clean ourselves up the best we can. And as we sit back down in our messiness... I just take that little toddler and I hold her and we get through the flight in our messiness together. Here's the lesson I learned. People are going to throw up all over you. People are going to spew words of nastiness intentionally or unintentionally. Sometimes on purpose. Sometimes it's thought out. But oftentimes it's those that are closest to us. What are we going to do in that messiness? What is our response? How are we going to handle that? What are we going to say? What are we going to do in the middle of that? Are we going to hold them together in our messiness? Or are we going to push them away? I got to be honest with you. There were times in relationships where I said, away with you. I don't need this. And I'm going to push you away rather than pull you close and get through this in relationship because the relationship was more important than I thought I was. And so people are going to be, make nasty stuff all over you. They're going to project words that hurt and cut deep 
And you may be having a cardigan on, and you may have to hold that in your pocket for a while as you try to clean up the best you can. And as you work through that, how will you respond? I know for the longest time, I didn't respond well. I talked about relationships and living in relationships, but I didn't always do that well. I would push people away because, again, it was more about me than about us in that relationship. You know, once you can get past that messiness piece in your own mind, um, and think with more of a selflessness, more thinking about the best for the other person rather than for yourself, then there are some steps we can take towards having healthy relationships with people, even in our messy, complicated lives yeah. that we have. And the first step that we can take is support. How do we support one another? It says in Scripture that Jonathan's soul was knit to the soul of David. They were actually in covenant with one another. Now, covenant in the Old Testament was a binding, unbreakable bond between two people. And these two people had that kind of relationship. Now, not all of our relationships are going to be soulmates, but I think we can see from their friendship some particular standards and, and patterns that we can apply to our own relationships that will be helpful. Now, these two guys grew up together. They had their times of fun. They had their times that they fought. But through it all, they remained selfless. They put the other in front of themselves. They were encouraging of each other. And probably most importantly, because they both messed up at one time or another, they were big on giving grace. They were big on giving grace. You know, too often we are quick to receive grace and really slow in extending that grace to other people. That's true, yeah. And grace doesn't mean you avoid it. No. That causes corruption in the relationship rather than caring for the person and saying, well, I'll just not talk about it. That's as bad as pushing away. Or we talk about grace, we say, well, we're supposed to speak the truth. Well, speaking the truth without love, Scripture says, grace without truth is no good, but truth without grace only kills the relationship. It doesn't show kindness in either way. Mm -hmm. Well, I want you to understand this family dynamic a little bit so that throughout the story you'll, you'll know what's happening if you're unfamiliar with Jonathan and David. So Jonathan's dad is King Saul, the ruler of Israel, and David is the mighty warrior that is leading Saul's armies to battle. And these boys, they, they, like I said, they grew up together. They lived life together. But Saul had some crazy side to him. He, he was pretty insane, and he was pretty jealous of David's popularity among the people. So he was constantly trying to have David killed. Well, one day David tells Jonathan, hey, your dad is trying to kill me. And Jonathan says, that can't be right. No, no, he's not trying to. But in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 13, I think we have that on the screen. Jonathan says to David, But if my father intends to harm you, may the Lord deal with Jonathan, be it ever so severely, if I do not let you know and send you away in peace. Over and over, Jonathan tells him, I'm going to support you. No matter what happens, I've got your back. I've got your back. There's a great quote by Arnold Glassow that says, A true friend never gets in your way unless you happen to be going down. Isn't that amazing? That we have people who can be our true support to cap capture us, to, to catch us when we are tripping. So that's the first thing, support in steps to a healthy relationship. The second thing is talk. Now when I say talk, I don't mean just words. I mean honest conversation. Really sharing your heart with another person. And, part, and the other side of that is being a good listener, right? So that you can hear what their heart is saying as well. Having great conversations and being open with one another. Then there's that other piece that not just talking to each other, but how do we talk about each other? What are we saying to other people about our friends? Are we lifting them up or are we tearing them down when we talk about them? So in 1 Samuel 19, Saul and Jonathan are in a field, and they're talking. 
and Saul is on one of his crazy moments, and he's ranting about David. And Jonathan's like, what are you talking about? David is your mighty warrior. He's the one out defeating all your enemies and making you look good. And by that, those words and lifting him up, he changes Saul's mindset about David and talks him off the ledge. It says in 1 Samuel 19, 4, And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father. He spoke well of him. We need to be lifting one another up. You know, we, it's important that we talk to each other well, but it's also important that we talk about each other well in kindness and raising people up in other people's eyes rather than tearing them down and destroying them. We can speak in love. Ephesians 4.15 says speak truth in love. But most of the time we need to speak kindness. We need to speak kindness. So talk or support and talk. Our third way of a step towards healthy relationship is show. Show. And this is just the practical aspect of doing things for one another, of physically getting up and helping each other through life. Being purposeful, being intentional, honoring your neighbor or your coworker or your friends with your actions in showing them how much you care for them. So as the story unfolds, Jonathan finally sees what David's talking about. He sees that Saul really is trying to kill him. And he says to David in uh, 1 Samuel 24, Then Jonathan said to David, Whatever you say, I will do for you. I'll do it for you. And actually, uh, Jonathan does put his own life in danger to get David out of the way of Saul, so he's saved. Now, you may never have the opportunity to literally save someone's life. I hope you don't have to. But how are we lifting people up? How are we making them feel valued? How do we let them know that we do care and we do love them? A couple of years after the grocery store incident, I was back in North Carolina for Raymond's funeral. A couple of weeks after we buried him, Mom and I were at the house alone, and the doorbell rang. And I went to answer it, and there stood that 20-something grocery clerk holding a $4 potted flower. And she said, I just heard that Mr. Wells had passed away. And I had to come and tell you how much he meant to me and how much I am really going to miss him. You see, I always said that Ray knew how to live in the now. And by that I mean he was fully present with every person he was with to let them know they were valued, they were heard, they were lifted up, and that he would do anything for them. Are you pulling people close? Or are you pushing them away? You see, that story grabs me for years. I would, I would talk, we would talk about relationships. And yet, when I think of that, I think, how am I in it for me? How can I network? How can I connect? How can this relationship benefit me? Although there were those other relationships, but those with intentionality. And really one of the things we say, whether it's corporate, whether it's church, whatever it is, we ought to live with intentionality, yeah. on purpose, fully present. is just such a powerful statement. When we engage in true relationships one with another, God is calling us to that, to, to really engage in those true relationships. And i got to tell you, when Gerilyn shared that first part of that story, I would have been one of the seven in line going, dude, guy. Get out of the way. I've got people to see and places to go, right? I've got people to hug. I don't need you chatting this woman up. 
And boy, God has really convicted me to say, slow down. I know you may be driven. So we're all different personalities and different types, but, but don't get caught in trying to do something that you miss the moment. We've said for years, create the experience to make the moment for your families. We're big into family, marriage, and parenting, and, and God's blessed us to have some avenues in, in ministry in those ways. And as we talk about that, it's like how are we making sure that happens in the relationships? And as we talk about these we cannot neglect or forget this relationship. Gerilyn talked about one of the primary ways of that support and that talk, talking about each other, but also our actions. And one of the greatest actions in an engaged relationship is listening. And Pastor Jeff, last week, as we've kind of, I think this just ties in hopefully well with the series that you're doing, but he talked about listening, listening to one another as well as listening to God. And that's what we want to ask you is, what is God saying to you? What is God saying to me? How are these relationships? What do you need to do to pull some people in and say, you know what? I need to receive you. I need to take you in. I need to hold you close. And I need to extend that forgiveness to you. I need to offer up a care for you. I need to offer up to be there for you. Maybe, just maybe, you're the one that's been spewing and you need to go and ask for forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Say, listen, I don't want this re- relationship to be broken. I want it to be healed. I want it to be whole. I want it to be deep. I want it to go next level. I want it to go further, and I need to do that. So what is God dealing with you about those relationships here? Are you listening to your Father's voice? Am I being quiet enough to hear or am I too busy talking and telling? Can you hear? Again, many years ago, our oldest was born. I was a dad for the first time. Because of an emergency C-section, Gerald and I got to hold our precious little girl for the first time. But then Gerald had to go into recovery because it was surgery. And it was a lot of years ago, and they've advanced those things. But even in that time, she was separated. I got to be with some of my family that was there and actually in the hospital uh, at the time of the birth and, and near. And so they got to see her for the first time in the nursery. And I am doing the video camera work. And it was several years ago, so it was the honking big video camera with a back battery pack and all those kinds of things. And I'm worried about filming my new little girl. She's here. She's beautiful. But we're watching her get bathed for the first time. And she is crying. You know that baby cry where it shakes every part of her body? Ooh, wah, ooh, wah, ooh, wah. And the nurse is washing her and bathing her. And her whole body's shaking. And I'm just filming because I think it's the cutest thing going on. And my family's trying to talk through the glass, but you can't really see her. You can hear her, but she has trouble hearing us. She's too busy crying and getting bathed. And the nurse finally wraps her up and snuggles her tight and, and holds her. And she opens the door. And I'm filming all of this as my family starts talking to her. And hi, sweetheart. And Oh, roly-poly and bubbles and all the nicknames they were giving her. And Lauren, and finally I said, realized I hadn't said anything. I said, hi, Lauren. It's your daddy. I was so busy filming, I missed this point. And all of a sudden, my sister-in-law said, look, she stopped crying. Not when the extended family talked, but when her daddy, because she recognized her daddy's voice. And all was right with her. Oh, that I would be still and be quiet in my busyness, in all of my crying and whining and complaining, that I would listen and I would be in that place where I hear when the Father whispers, when the Father may have to scream, when the Father speaks, I hear and I listen and I respond. What is the Father saying to you? Because I want to talk about this relationship just for a moment. 
maybe you haven't heard your heavenly father's voice. Abba, one of the descriptions of him is uh, daddy. Abba, father, daddy. What is he saying to you? And how is your relationship with him? We want to encourage you. One thing that's beautiful about this relationship with Jonathan and David in 1 Samuel 20, verse 42, then Jonathan said to David, go in peace, for we have a sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord. You see, this relationship with Jonathan and David was through this relationship with their father. So how is this relationship and what is God speaking to you? And maybe your heavenly father is calling you into a relationship with him. And then you can deal with these. Many of you may have that relationship with him, but these are being affected. And if these are affected and these are not right and you're not pulling people in the messiness and staying in that relationship and making sure it's right, this relationship is going to be affected. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. And before the song is even sung, I want us just to take a moment in silence to hear what our Heavenly Father might be saying because if we truly listen, we recognize His voice. Then the question I have is, what will we do with that? You see, knowing what to do and doing it are two different things. Are we listening and are we responding? Are we acting in obedience How is your relationship with your Heavenly Father? How is your relationship with those that you see? Because see, if one is affected, the other is affected. How will you respond?